Good day, everyone. We're now at the beginning of our webinar for today. Today is February 6, 2018. I'm your host, Mike Lasecki. Today's topic is taking stock and planning for success. I'm about to in introduce today's presenters, but first, let me remind you that this webinar is being recorded. You'll automatically get a link to the recording. And this webinar is hosted by ATE Central. ATE Central acts as an information hub for the National Science Foundation ATE grantee community. We acknowledge them and the grateful support from the National Science Foundation. Let me begin today by introducing Rachel Bauer. Rachel, you're the PI of ATE Central at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Thank you for joining us today. Tell us a little bit about the webinar and then go ahead and introduce your co-presenters. Thanks so much, Mike. As usual, we're thrilled to be here. Um, talking about this topic that's so important to the ATE community and to many uh, communities of folks who are grant funded or have projects that they're trying to think about sustaining long term. Just to remind you, Mike mentioned this, but if, you, if you're just coming on, um, you're, those of you who are joining us are in listen only mode, but we are going to be taking breaks for questions and the, the way to ask a question is to go ahead and, and um, pop your question into that chat um, window you can see up to the right you should be able to see a little blank spot where you can type a question in and we'll be stopping um, and doing uh, we'll be stopping at various points to, to let you ask questions but please feel free to put a question in any time and I'll be keeping an eye on that as we go um, also we will have polls and and those are very easy to answer so we'll, we'll have some polls in just a second as we learn more about you but first I'd like to introduce Nancy Marin who is our primary presenter today she's from blue sky to blueprint do you want to just say hi Nancy hi everyone glad to be with you today All right let's just advance our slide here and we're also thrilled to have Lori Wingate with us many of you may know Lori if you're part of the AT community already she's the PI of Evaluate Lori do you want to just say a quick hello and you'll be introducing yourself in a little bit more detail later uh, hi everyone greetings from Kalamazoo I'm glad to be here with you all right so we have someone named Holly Ann who's having trouble Holly Ann are you still not she, it says she's not hearing anything, so maybe Shannon can help her um, if she's still having trouble. All right, so yes, we'll take um, off. one of the th okay, thanks so much. One of the things that I mentioned is that we'd be um, doing some polling, and we'd love to know a little bit about how who you all are. Mike has, is going to open up a poll here for us, and <clears throat> we want to know who you are, how you would describe yourself. So are you affiliated already with an AT grant? Are you possibly affiliated with another NSF granting program, maybe IUs or STEM or something else? Maybe you're not currently funded but are writing an AT grant or other. And if you're other, <clears throat> this is a good time to practice um, uh, putting something in that chat box because we'd love to know who you are. So it looks like there is one other at this point, and that person looks like they're typing. Not surprisingly, we have a lot of folks affiliated. Most people are affiliated with an AT grant currently. A couple of other people who are writing, a few other people who are writing grants. This is fairly normal for what we see in these webinars. Um, okay, give you another minute or so. Okay, thanks so much, Mike. I think we can move along there from the poll. Right. So most of you um, are involved with ATE, but just as a little refresher, ATE stands for Advanced Technological, Ed Technological Education. Um, it is an NSF funding stream with this big focus on technician education and, and mostly based at community colleges, which is very unusual for NSF. It's NSF's only um, grant funding program that really focuses on funding program improvement, program development, professional development at community colleges. Right now we have about 306 projects and centers currently funded. Uh, those of you who are, who are part of ATE know that the projects tend to be uh, smaller in scale and the centers are a little larger. We feel like it's that it's much more than a funding program, that it's a real community. There's a lot of support um, for the, the ATE grantees. 
and a lot of cross-cutting support for all of us in the community. Um, and that's really one of the primary purposes of my own grant, uh, AT Central. This project is really designed to amplify the impact and support the work of AT grantees. We have an information hub and portal, as Mike said, a resource collection, and we do all kinds of services and, and create all kinds of tools to help AT grantees do the work that, that they're excited to be doing. One of them is this series of sustainability um, workshops and webinars. Nancy, can you believe it's been, this is our fifth year of doing this. I don't know how. I cannot. Seems... I was going to make a joke about like the Prairie Home Companion, but I don't know I if know. that's politically correct, even in babies. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. I, I don't know where the five years went, but one of the things that we really work, we really strive to be is community driven and in, in a bunch of our surveys, sustainability uh, of, of the community, surveys of community, sustainability kind of rose to the top as an issue that people felt there was significant need for support around. And so um, we've done workshops and webinars every year of the grant in, in this area. And just as a little aside, if any of you are interested, you can go back up um, onto AT Central and you can find the recordings of all the webinars that, that we've done, uh, as well as some other materials online. So I'm going to turn it over to Nancy, who's going to talk a little bit about Ithaca and her uh, her own background. Thanks, Rachel, and hi, everybody. Um, we're, it's always exciting to see when we when we look at uh, the registration for these events because it's kind of humbling uh, how many people are out there in ATE land and how many join us for these events. Uh, so I, I really encourage people to participate, put things in the chat window when you have questions. We, we just want to make this as useful as we can for everyone there. When When Rachel and I started working together, it was because uh, she had come to the organization I worked for at the time called Ithaca. Uh, and I should mention a little bit about them because it's, it's a pretty interesting organization and it may well be helpful to you at some point. You may know JSTOR itself, which is a big database of journal articles and now primary source materials, books, all sorts of things. But a lot of students use it in, in uh, academic institutions of all types. Uh, Portico is a little more specialized. That's actually a digital preservation service, if that's something that you are interested in. But then Ithaca SNR does a lot of studies and consulting and research, and that's really where I focused my energies. Today they're doing terrific work that has to do with innovative models of leadership in higher education, things around diversity, things around student success. So you may want to tap in to check out their website. There's a lot of free materials there that might be quite useful to you. The piece I focused on, uh, which I now do with my own consulting firm, is a little bit different from that, and that's really a straight on about sustainability. And the way I think about that, uh, you'll see throughout this session and throughout the whole series we'll do together, but it's really the, the idea of taking a business mindset and applying it to fields where that's not necessarily the default mindset. So how can you take some of the good tools that work for people in the private sector and have them work for us here in the academic sector? So on my own, uh, and, and at least with my firm now, I should say, uh, I still focus on business strategy for leaders who are in higher education. I specialize in things that have to do with scholarly communications, with technology and, and data repositories, but it always comes down to the same question. What do the leaders of projects like this need to be doing to make sure that their projects are sustainable? So if you want to look at my website too, you'll see lots of case studies, reports, um, outlining some great examples you might want to see and some general guidance. So what you'll see um, in this workshop is tends to be derived from things I've learned doing that work. So Rachel and I, maybe after years one and two, where we just tried to think of three great ideas, we, we started to try to think of ways to conceive of what we offer each year as a series. And so this year, we thought it might be really like immediately useful and also quite provocative to think about what does it mean to do a health check? What you know, how how critical is it to think about sustainability uh, for the work that you're doing right now, and what are the different aspects of it that we may not have covered in quite this way in the past. So we have a very nice series laid out over the next three months. There are three different events. I think I have a slide that actually lists them all. So today we'll be talking with Lori, and we're really just going to talk at first about how do you look around and figure out how urgent your sustainability situation is. And again, we're going to unpack what sustainability means. And the first thing is let's take stock and see where we're at. The next quest, question is really, once we know that, how much do we want to adjust the goals we originally set? What is it going to look like to literally make a new plan for 
uh, future sustainability. Um, if we assume that there may not be a grant, for example, or if we just want to look for some further independence. And that we're going to be joined by Ann Bahealer. And she's joined us before. And I bet many of you know her already. And she's, she's a wonderful uh, partner on these webinars. And then we're going to take a look at a topic that everyone, there's someone in every event, I think Rachel and I do, who will bring up succession planning if we haven't already brought it up. So it occurred to us, we might as well actually try to gather some good thinking about what that really looks like. So in our final session for this season, we're going to be talking straight on about succession planning. What it looks like when you know, you personally may be moving on. Uh, there may be members of your team you want to think about. And even if you're not moving on, what kinds of assurances do you want to kind of build into the way your project runs so that any transition is a very smooth transition? So we're hoping that these three together give everyone some nice ways to think about uh, you know, what life might look like beyond the grant. But let's get back to today. <laughs> so the goals of today's webinar are to introduce or you know, maybe just to remind about what a broad definition of sustainability is. That, that word itself can be a little opaque if we don't break that down a little. Then I'm going to share what um, I'm going to call the health check method, um, which you'll see is, is a semi-fancy term for a very, very down-to-earth set of questions you're going to ask yourself. It's a way to look at your work through the lens of sustainability and future success. And then finally, we're very fortunate to be able to offer the perspective of someone deeply experienced in doing a lot of this kind of question asking. So you'll see when Lori comes in and is able to speak with us about evaluation, how closely uh, the tools that she uses and the ways that she thinks about evaluation really are going to support your quest for a strong sustainability plan. So before we get started, to kick things off, I think we have a poll question. Yeah, we do. We have a second poll question for you. And we just wanted to see how often your project or center gathers data on, on your key metrics. So Mike's opening that up. Um, so do you do it every week, kind of a matter of course, about once a month, once a year, or only when you need to file some kind of a report with your funder? Okay. And Rachel, if you don't mind, can I encourage people, since other is so hard to sort, yes. can people type into the chat window? Because I am so curious if it's other. Like every yeah. three weeks? I okay, we're know. getting, I know, we're getting quarterly. Oh, we're getting at the end of each semester, which, you know, we so should have put on there. That makes so much sense, right? Yep. Every semester and quarterly seem to be the other, yep, end of each semester. So that, that we should have known that would be. Yeah. So it seems like quarterly and semester are the ones that we didn't we didn't factor in because we have a lot of people in the other. In fact, the other is is second to the top. Yeah, and if if this were if we were all kind of in the same space, a question I would love to see a show of hands for is, you know, does it depend? Right. I think there's always an it's depend the it depends kind of option where. There's some things you need to check every day or every week, and some things, you know, once every six months or a semester is more than enough. I wonder if folks have thoughts on that. Yeah, there's a lot of it depends, right? Yeah, thanks, Adam. I, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm guessing that that's probably a more nuanced approach. But, but this is really encouraging. And if, if you kind of combine the folks who are pretty much doing it a semester, which is a good unit if what you're measuring is, for example, enrollment or something taking right. place in a semester, that, that's a perfect logic for doing that. If the once the once a year people I'm going to attempt to convince that it's probably not often enough. <laughs> so spoiler <Yeah>. alert. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let's move on then. Thanks, Mike. All right. So um, here's the little refresher. Those of you who have come to these before, apologies, but I'm kind of kind of like talking about it this way because I think it's useful to think about sustainability uh, as as a bit of a cycle. So let me tell you what I mean by that. I, I don't think one way to think about sustainability, and I've heard people do this, is to say, well, I'm still here, aren't I? <laughs> Therefore, I must be doing something right. I am sustainable. I have been sustained. And, and I think that's fine. And that's actually, I mean, I'm sure dictionary-wise, probably quite accurate. But in terms of thinking, uh, looking to the future, um, I'm going to encourage you to think about this as a way to gauge how likely it is that the systems you've put in place um, are going to 
make it possible for you to be uh, providing the value that you were brought on to provide today, in, years into the future. And it often doesn't look exactly the same years into the future that it does today. But what it has in common is that you found some kind of magic here where you figured out how to deliver something really valuable and the folks to whom you're delivering it in whatever form it takes have also acknowledged it is really valuable and they're giving things back to you. And they may be giving you things that are financial support or they may be giving you things that are just valuable relationships and time. There's a whole different way, lots of ways that you can deliver them value and they can send it back to you. But I'm going to suggest that you should be able to articulate what that cycle of support is. So I'd like to think about sustainability as the ability to generate or gain access to the resources, which can be financial or non-financial, that you're going to need to protect and increase the value. So not just to make something once, but to continue to increase the value of the content, the service, whatever it is that you're creating for the people who really need it. So when you've got a sustainability plan, some people, you know, maybe it looks like a business plan, maybe it's a spreadsheet, maybe it's just a statement, but it's a logic. It's a certain strategy that's based on real evidence, not just I hope it works, but a real strategy for identifying and securing those ongoing sources of support so it'll allow you to keep on, on building out what you do. Does anyone have any question about that basic kind of statement? All right, well, keep, keep uh, typing in that window when things come up. So when I say a cycle, I'm going to even suggest that there's a kind of a general flow to things you might want to explore when you're thinking about what that cycle could look like. And this is going to translate directly into the what we're talking about in terms of a health check and even in terms of evaluation. So I like to think of an initial grant proposal as I had a great idea. Boy, I hope someone else agrees it's a great idea. But right now it's just a great idea. As I'm writing it, I might want to think about some other things. So if you look at the top of this slide where I'm, I mention external factors, there are things that are operating on your great idea that help to shape it. You might refine who that audience is to, to sharpen up who you're delivering it to, students at a certain level in a specific discipline. You might look around the external environment. That's my little trees in the forest. You look around in the environment. You might figure, you know, there's someone else doing something quite similar. I really need to beef up this side of what I'm doing so that it's, it's special and it's unique. So those external forces operate to help you deliver something that is, uh, you know, unique, special, and delivering value to a real specific audience. So if you've done a good job with that, you, that's probably why you were funded in the first place. Someone agreed that you were doing something that no one else was for an audience that really needed it and would appreciate it. So once you have that concept, if you look at the arrow heading down, you do a lot of goal setting. You figure out, great, I have a general idea, but now, what, do we, what is it really going to deliver? What's the impact I want to have it deliver? Once I name what that impact is, what activities are going to have to support it? How much is it going to have to cost? And what are my funding sources going to be? So I'm sure I'm not giving anything away <laughs> if I say that I have probably just walked you through a, a list of um, things that you have seen when you do your evaluation and you think about the topics you need to worry about. Well, when we look at this as a cycle, so first we define the initiative, we create the value proposition, and we define that logic model based on the goals, what's the other kind of cascade of things that have to happen from the activities to the cost to the sources. What if something changes? What if something changes? For example, with my scrappy looking little X through the word funding sources, what if all of a sudden you don't have the same funding source you had before? Well, that's when those cute little arrows come into play that are swerving up and down. And that suggests you might have to look at the balance of what's going on outside. Did the environment change? Did the funder change? And do I have to change what the offer is? So if one element changes, what do I have to look at to figure out what a new plan and a new strategy might be? 
in order to be sustainable. Any questions here? We do have one, it looks like, or it's sort of a comment question. Uh, I suppose my value proposition will be quite different for industry versus academic stakeholders. So I think, you know. You know, I would say. Go, go ahead. Sorry, Nan. Yeah, and so um, this is a pretty, um, this is a pretty generic approach to when I say a value proposition, because you're, you're absolutely right. And in fact, when you really start to dig into a value proposition, it, it almost has to be tied to a very specific uh, type of either user, audience, segment, stakeholder. It almost is not meaningful unless it, it names to whom it's valuable. So you're right, even in, in terms of one initiative, you could have multiple value propositions. One is how it serves students, and another may be how it how it uh, appeals to other stakeholders like the industry partners. Is that what you meant, Mr. Imus? <laughs> is, have I got, did I address that actual question? <laughs> yeah, and yeah, so I'm glad. So, and that's a, that's a really great point. I guess my, and, and in fact, if one of the elements in this little picture changes, it can literally throw the other ones a little bit out of whack and it doesn't have to throw them in a bad direction. It might suggest great opportunities or it can suggest uh, the need to act quickly to fix something. Uh, but in either case, it's going to require that you go right back. You have to look back at that external environment, take another look at the audience, figure out if there's any recalibration that will have to take place. So when you do that recalibration, you know, the whole system starts again. So maybe you decide you have to approach a different group of users, or you have to broaden the group of users. Well. That may alter the way you define those goals. It may mean you need to set some new goals, you need to identify activities to reach them, et cetera, et cetera. So in this sense, it's also a cycle. It's a cycle of kind of questioning and refining as any of the variables change. All right, so we did just have one question for Max. Anybody else? Well, it's a natural breaking point as we get through the, the sort of discussion around sustainability. Um, I'm not spotting anything, Nancy, so, but if people have questions, as we said, we'd love to get them in the chat window, so. Yeah, that's fine. We'll keep looking. So, again, like even when I read through this, I keep thinking, wow, this sounds a lot like some evaluation questions you might have. Um, and in fact, when Lori and I were talking about this webinar, she actually reminded me that there really is um, a, a, a logic, a template for developing a logic model. A lot of funders, not just NSF, require something like this to have people think through based on long-term outcomes. What, is, what are the cycle of resources coming in, activities to do that you're going to need uh, to consider? And so I, I definitely wanted to, want to highlight that this is um, not a very different set of questions, but a very related set of questions that you're likely to have. Um, I wanted to mention that, uh, well, actually, let me, let me pause here. And actually, Lori, since this is a slide that actually comes from Evaluate, uh, if you wanted to share with us a little bit about maybe even at the the question that came up earlier, in terms of how often you actually, once you've created something like this, how, how often do you encourage people to revisit it? Um, sure. So, yeah, it, just to affirm what you were just saying, Nancy, that your model uh, is one way of, you know, thinking about sustainability. And as we were talking about this and when we were rehearsing this session, I immediately thought of the logic model. And your point about what happens when one of these things would go away, we can apply that for those who are more familiar with the logic model to the logic model set setup where we see the resources or the inputs column. And if those are the things we need to enable us to, to engage in our activities and bring about our outcomes, 
to your very point, what happens when one of those important resources goes away, whether it's a partner or a funder or whatever. So when we do set up an evaluation plan at the beginning of a project, um, it's facilitated by a logic model like this one. This is a blank one, obviously, and we would fill it in for the particular project. But mapping out the project in this way is really helpful for planning the evaluation activities because you can you could focus your evaluation on any one of these columns. Are the it, are the inputs adequate? Um, are the activities done well and reaching the right people? Are the products high quality? Are we getting those those short-term outcomes? Is that building towards the mid and long-term outcomes? So to get to your question about how frequently we would evaluate or revisit this logic model, I, mean, I would really encourage folks to think about it in an ongoing way. So you set up your evaluation, you conduct it, you're always looking at, hopefully, you're looking at your results on a regular basis. You ask that question about how frequently people are collecting data. So you know if you're collecting data every semester, I would hope that folks would be looking at those results every semester and making adjustments along the way. And so you can come back to the logic model and make adjustments if you see it's not working out as you had planned, or, or maybe it's just fine. But I think it's just another tool to use to look, look at your project overall and plan the evaluation. And hopefully, um, it's something you do on a regular basis. Thanks, Lori. And so, um, and in terms of like what people are looking for, um, I'd like to just, I mean, you'll see what the questions are. We're about to kind of get into that piece, but you'll notice that there really probably isn't anything that I would, I'm going to ask as a question that you probably haven't thought of in some way before. This may just be a different way to think about it and a different frequency of thinking about it, but it doesn't necessarily require a whole new set of metrics to measure. Um, it's simply a different lens uh, to look at it through. So what, like, why, why do you have to do more work? <laughs> so there are, there are a couple of reasons I would suggest. And um, this is where I would also love to hear people's examples if you'd like to share them in the chat window. But there's a few reasons. The first is just good basic management. Um, you know, you set goals, you have metrics, you have key performance indicators. Is anyone out there laughing at me for saying that? Um, I got a lot of pushback for using that term. But, um, you know, you, you have ways of measuring if things are going the way you want them to go. So you want to check. The other thing that's actually more useful is if something isn't going the way you want it to go, it's a way of catching that before it's too late. Um, you know, if you have certain things that are critical to you um, and you, you keep an eye on the way things are trending, Maybe a little blip, not so bad. Maybe if things aren't going quite well for two or three semesters in a row, you know it's a problem, or two or three weeks in a row. Um, there's another reason, too, which is actually much more optimistic. You might do a check like this and see some, some uh, anomaly in the reporting. Uh, you realize that actually, wow, there's actually more uptake in, in a different segment of our audience, for example, than we, than we thought we'd get. And maybe that gives you the idea for a way to increase your, your, uh, your activities for a new audience segment you hadn't even considered. So there might be ways that encourage you to, uh, to invest further or build out further because you're getting positive response from looking at this. And finally, it just overall gives you a way to prioritize. So you, know, you start off, um, you might have five different areas of activity that you're engaging in, and you start to notice that you know, numbers four and five aren't really going as strong as numbers one, two, and three. It gives you a personal logic with your leadership team to figure out um, how you want to maybe bolster the first three and let the let the last two um, fade, it, fade out a little. So I see that there's a question, but I don't see the question. Yeah, there is. Um, it, Michael asked, is there such a thing as a sustainability model? So he was asking Lori, but I think Nancy, this is it's probably a good question to ask you. It, in other words, it's actually a great yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I think I know what you're getting at. Um, like, is there a tool that looks like that logic model, if that's what you're asking? And the answer is not exact. Yeah, and um, but I'm thinking maybe it might be time to design one. Um, so there's certain things, like there's a fellow, Alex, I think, Osterwalder, who's created something called like the business model canvas. 
He has a not-for-profit version. He has a value proposition canvas. It's essentially a sheet of paper where you write things in boxes that have headings. Um, but it prompts you to think about certain things. And, um, and, uh, I, and I can see the value. There, there's a, there is like a document that looks a little bit like this logic model, but I call it it's a sustainability planning framework. And actually, Rachel, we, that we could certainly, that's, uh, we've shared that in other webinars. I, we could certainly uh, send it around to folks, uh, that we contact after this webinar. Uh, I, think ends. It's, I think it's on And what it does is it's a logic, it's got to be, right? Um, yeah. it's, it's essentially, it's really useful. It, it's, I always fi find it's funny, right? Because on one hand, it really is also, it's just a sheet of paper <laughs> or just like a Word doc. But what it, what it encourages you to do is start up top at the impact stage, name something big and important that you intend to accomplish, and to drive that goal down through the actual workaday activities you'll need to do, the people you'll need to have do them, how much it's going to cost to accomplish this. And then the last line is the real punchline. You know, what is it going to cost? Where are we going to get the funds? And, um, you know, it's a very simple sheet. But um, I'm happy to share that. Have a look on ATE Central. And if not, we can certainly, we can certainly find another way to share it. Um, it doesn't have the same pretty graphic logic of a cycle. And that's the only, that's the only down thing. If I could find a way to design it more cleverly to imply that, that's, that's something I would still like to do. But yeah. So there's nothing formal. The other thing you should know is that, um, I've worked with folks at NEH, at, at, at NSF, lots of other funders. You're correct if, you, if you're also suggesting that there's not a lot of agreement on exactly what needs to be in a sustainability model. But um, I, I would always argue that when you include that in your funding proposals, it's really the underlying logic should be sound. Um, if you make an argument about why some kind of support is forthcoming, um, it should not just be based on um, optimism <laughs> and hope. <laughs> but it should be based on, I have looked out there, here's what the competition is, or I've spoken to my audience, and here's what their needs are. And so in that sense, it's really um, a logic. OK, <laughs> moving on, moving on. Uh, Nancy, let's have a look another, at what this health check is. N Nancy, there is another yeah. question. Before we lose, l let's take a moment here, because Adam has a really great question, too, which is how do you differentiate gathering data to meet certain metrics or indicators versus gathering data to measure sustainability? Or when is it appropriate, when is it appro the appropriate time to begin measuring sustainability outcomes? So it might be that, Lori, do you want to talk a little bit about or Lori or Nancy, I mean, either one, to me, they're sort of integrated that you're, you know, you, when you're thinking about evaluation, one of the things that you're hopefully thinking about is measuring some of the things you need for sustainability, too. But I, I'm curious to see what you guys say. Lori, I'm happy to jump in, but did you want to? I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll add on if you have anything <laughs> okay. to add. Yeah. So um, I'm sorry, I'm just I'm scanning. Yeah. So the, the um, right, okay. So the question is differentiate gathering data to meet certain metrics versus to measure sustainability. So I, I guess the difference is um, I've seen a lot of data gathering that does a very good job of literally capturing the data. And I think what we're talking about when you're looking with an eye to sustainability, it's how you interpret it. So it's one thing, you know, what you, it's, um, it's asking yourself, is it trending in the right direction? Is it giving me information to make strategic choices? So I, I see the word strategy planning models, strategic planning models through some, from someone else. And yes, this is the same kind of logic. I mean, I think the idea is how can a, the, the good practice that you already have as part of this funding stream, how can the good practice of capturing data for evaluation purposes let you be the evaluator. Do I think this is going well? Where do I need to change it? Is it going as quickly as it could be or it should be? Um, do I see an opportunity out there to, to grow some area of this more? Because I noticed, again, some, some kind of something quirky out there that actually shows me a new market I can expand into. Uh, and by market, in this case, it could be, again, a different type of student, a different geography for a student, a different type of industry partner. But again, um, it's really quite similar. The biggest difference is that uh, the recommendation here is that you not just gather it, because NSF has said you should gather it, but you're actually actively saying, what do I understand better now, and what am I going to do about that? 
So you're going to see a series of questions. This is just one approach to use. And again, it's, it, this is really um, very similar to questions you may be asking. In terms of the questions you're going to ask yourself, they're going to be your questions. These are prompts to encourage you to think about the questions you may have for yourself. So again, nothing new here. The questions you're going to be asking should be pretty closely tied into the things that you determined way back when in your initial setup of evaluation metrics, what you thought were, was important. So for example, if you take a look, let's start with the environment. What's the world look like today? How is the funding landscape? Are the funders I'm counting on, you know, still writing checks? Great. You know, what does the competition look like? Gee, when I got funded, you know, three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, I was the only one doing this. Am I still alone in this field? And am I, am I sure about that? Is there anyone emerging who might be competitive? Even if the competition isn't direct competition, is there something else going on that's, that's a little too similar? How about political forces, uh, things that might have an impact on the budget of my institution? What are the different things changing in the world around me that might make me want to pay attention and see if there's any opportunity or risk on the horizon? And then, you know, why not? No one knows what will, the future will bring, but the, let's take some educated guesses. How is this likely to develop over the next, say, three years? Are the trends that I'm forecasting likely to be in support of what I'm doing, or, or might they be challenging for me? So this is, a, this is a pretty basic set of questions. In the chat window, are there any specific environmental related questions that people look at for themselves? I'd love to hear some real specific examples if anyone would like to share. What are the things that you really are going to have an impact on how well and how successful your project or center is? Just the external forces that might have some impact on what it is that you do. I see typing. The projected job market, perfect. Yeah, that's exactly. A great one. If if what you're Industry. delivering are skilled candidates, you really need to know. <laughs> yeah, new technologies are placing old ones. We just got industry cycles. Right. Exactly. So in your field, you're going to know, and, and and in fact, these are actually relevant probably to everybody in the in the individual fields they cover. Perfect example, um, if things take a massive change and you've made a very big investment in one direction, you may need to be light-footed in, in, in adjusting that direction. And actually, Mike, is, um, is this a good time? Actually, I don't know if this is where we had planned, but is this a time to mention that kind of shift in direction for you? I'm sorry, Nancy, it took me a moment to come off of mute there. You know, I was struck by that comment. I just realized about I gave you a nice cycle. segue. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You know, when I was fortunate to be involved with one of the ATE centers in semiconductor manufacturing, and boy, in the early days, late 90s, the industry was going great. Our programs were, were really expanding. We went from 20 some to 80 some programs in four years around the country. And then the industry hit a wall in 2000. I mean, they just stopped hiring, literally stopped hiring. And so if a program at a college had the, the word semiconductor manufacturing on it, students were saying, wait a minute, I can read the news headlines. There's no jobs there. There's no hiring. So the program started to shift. And we did too. We started renaming, re reconfiguring sort of re-imaging ourselves as automation, robotics, automated manufacturing, things like that. We started changing the titles, started re-emphasizing our curriculum. And although the programs never recovered to the heyday, they did gradually increase uh, their enrollments again, and they broadened themselves so they weren't so specific. But I think it was being aware of those industry trends Sure, we were reactive, but we also felt we were, weren't only reactive, we were a bit more on top of things by anticipating those changes and paying attention. So it was, it was tough. It was a hard lesson, but I really started paying a lot more in attention to the cyclical nature of these technology industries at that point. So thanks for the opportunity yeah. for that comment, uh, Nancy. Yeah, no, and Mike, that's like a, that's a perfect example of where you know paying attention to that it allows you not to kind of get caught 
off guard. I think, and Rachel, you had mentioned that I should bring up um, Michelle and Vesta, and it's a slightly different flavor here. So I don't actually, and Michelle, if you're on the line, <laughs> you should jump in and do a better job than I will um, of explaining this. But what, what I understood is the interesting example um, for her and this team is that this initiative, which is to offer changing in the wine industry, the grape and wine industry, is that um, I think where, where, they, where they started as this partnership of institutions, um, there was such uptake that they also realized that there was kind of this latent um, demand just from maybe mid-career professionals who just wanted this degree. And so it led to a, a different strand that weren't people in the institutions then taking this program, but people who would come to the program and then enroll in the institutions. So again, by, um, by, by paying attention to what was going on in the external environment, uh, they were able to expand in different ways. Rachel, was there anything else on this example you wanted me to highlight? No, no. I think it, I think the only other thing was that they ended up um, figuring out a model that had a lot more online courses, and so they were marrying people working at small vineyards with online courses, so that they didn't have uh, because there wasn't a program near them too. So that was another shift right. in the in the way the program worked. Yeah. So I'm just I'm going to keep moving because I'm also realizing that we our time is not limitless. Um, but um, it, so so the environment is critical, and and Vest is a great example, and Maytech was a great example for Mike. So another area is audience, and in fact, some of the Vest example reminds me of things that have to do with who your kind of target audience is. So who does that look like today? Um, Maybe it's just the same people. Maybe you're noticing different folks who are finding benefit from it. But so some things you might want to look at, the number of people who are engaging with what you're doing. In your case, it might be students enrolling, uh, that sort of thing. The type of people, uh, are there issues around gender or different types of demographics that you're trying to attract? How are you doing with those goals? Is it about the way in which they engage? Meaning, are they participating in the ways, at the depth, uh, in the, with the consistency, doing the kinds of activities that are the things that you were thinking they would do? So um, I should mention here, I see a question in the chat box about what is a KPI. And um, I believe it is a key performance indicator. And honestly, you can just call it a straight up metric or an evaluation criterion. But it's the idea that you've actually zeroed in on, I will know that my project, my center, is doing really well if, if these numbers are heading in the direction I want them to be as quickly as I want them to be. So again, so for audience, it's whatever you felt that was going to be. My project or my center will be a success if I have uh, full enrollment for all three sections of a course. OK, how is that going? <laughs> so it's a set of questions. So here what we're doing is we're really testing assumptions. We're testing the assumptions that you had when you got into this. How is it matching up? And in the next three years, what's likely to develop? How is it likely to continue? So are there any examples of what people think the really key things they need to be measuring every month, every semester? What are the key things around your audience, your users, your stakeholders? that are going to tell you that this is successful or not, or at least heading in the right direction? I'm, I'm betting we I'm get lots of people talking someone about talking. Yeah, I bet we get a lot of discussion around enrollment or numbers of students or internships or you know things like yeah. that, I would think. but. Yeah, OK, well, and if there's no thoughts now, you just jump in, jump in later. So I'll give you a quick example. So again, if you've joined me before, bear with me. I love this example. I know it's not an ATE project or center, but I'll see if I can quickly summarize a, a neat way that they use data to make a change. This is a citizen science project that lives or dies based on how many people go out, watch birds in the wild, and enter data into a database. Um, if, they, if a lot of people do that, it's a very robust database and can do lots of magical things like track migratory patterns of all kinds of birds. And then lots of uh, research scientists, policymakers, ornithologists are very excited. They can do great research. 
at a certain point, they noticed early on in their, in their life that they weren't getting the usage they needed. The, the inputs were not what they needed to be. They had plateaued. And by looking at this, the numbers were still pretty high. But it wasn't high enough, and they knew it wasn't as high as it should be based on the research they'd done to understand how big the population of birders was. Long story short, they used that observation about the plateauing of their numbers to retool everything. They hired new people, specifically people who would understand the native bird watching audience a little bit better, and they really rebuilt a value proposition to appeal to amateur birders, not just to research scientists. And it's a very happy ending. They've, they've done very well since then. But the key point here is that they, they notice this by, uh, by zeroing in on those metrics and noticing when the, the line swooping up had started to level. So we've talked about all the assumptions. Now let's talk a little bit about the activity and your successes, right? So this is the thing you got here to do. You're going to want lots of questions around how it's going. The thing we promised to deliver, how are the activities that we promised to do, the outputs from those activities, how are those things measuring up, what's likely to change? Again, this is probably the meat and potatoes of your original evaluation instruments. Now, we've been talking about kind of the external world, right? What are all these forces operating that we're going to have to be aware of, protect ourselves of, take advantage of? But now let's look at internal operations for a minute. So what does it look like to run this thing today? Are we able to manage what we're doing with the budget we've got? How likely are the assurances from the folks who are our in-kind partners so that we know that that's still going to keep coming? So in other words, what are our costs like today? Are they going to grow? Are they going to decrease? Um, is our host institution going to keep letting us have that free office and space and tech support, or is that going to change? So that's going to be important to understand as well. How about the funding landscape? This might be the most important thing that we all look at. What's the funding look like today? How much is, how deep is the assurance that I'm going to continue to get funds where I think I will? Will that be enough to accomplish the goals I've set? And how many sources do I have out there? Finally, am I even in a position to project out three years today? And then finally, again, you know, how is this likely to change? What's my level of comfort? Not just that it's good today, but that it's going to stay as good as it needs to. And finally, let's talk about leadership and, and the functioning of the entity that you've got, whether it's a small team or a big team. How stable is the leadership? I mean, how, how stable, how reliable, how easy is it to keep the team in place? Does the team have the skills we need? Are we going to have to change something there? And in the next three years, is that current leadership team going to be the same team? We have anyone retiring. We have recruiting going on for people leaving. How good is our pipeline so we know we'll always be able to get someone back? So there's a lot of questions around that that you're going to want to think of, too. And anyone who's had to deal with critical staff departures knows that that's a key part of sustainability as well. If you have key members leave, um, that actually throws a lot of the other elements up in the air. I'll take a pause here to catch any other questions before we get to hear from Lori. Any questions here, Rachel, we should pick up on? Uh, we have one person write in that um, that shared resources is, a, is an important thing to measure, and I think that's a great point. And again, there the question is, it's great that they're shared now. These, um, the, I think you you refer to them as accumulated assets. And one of the questions you want to ask is, you know, what governs that? Is it permanent? Is it ongoing? Do we need to, is it a relationship we need to nurture? That sort of thing. And someone else mentions that it's important to know what's going on in a partner organization, right. someone who's that offering a lot of referrals. So again. That's a great one, too. Great point. Right. All right, so let's move on. I want to make sure we get a chance to get to Lori before too much longer. So um, I'm going to actually turn things over to Lori, who's going to introduce herself, and then we're going to have a chat with, with, with you all in the living room with us. All right, Lori, 
tell us about yourself and about Evaluate before we get started. Hi. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. So I am, again, Lori Wingate. I'm the Principal Investigator and Director of Evaluate, and we capitalize the ATE there because we are the Evaluation Resource Center for NSF's ATE program, which we keep referencing in this webinar, obviously, so I know many of you are familiar with it. So what we do at Evaluate is um, we serve the ATE community and others by holding webinars on evaluation periodically. We uh, maintain an open access resource library. And uh, as we were talking, I, my long-term memory was uh, sparked, and I did a quick search on our uh, on our website for some resources that I, I thought might exist with regard to sustainability in the ATE program. Um, so if at some you know, after this webinar, folks want to go onto our website, and the URL is right there, and just put in sustainability in the search function. We have a lot of different uh, pieces from research reports to little blogs and newsletters and, and things like that. So you might want to check out what we have on that right guard. We're certainly no experts like uh, Nancy and Rachel, but we do have a few things that might be of interest. Um, we also have a blog and a quarterly newsletter that we publish on different evaluation topics. And we also run a survey of uh, all ATE grantees annually. So we prepare reports and data snapshots to help people learn about the activities and achievements of the ATE program. So that is what uh, we do in a nutshell. And uh, also, if you go to our website, um, we do have a webinar coming up. So if folks do want to learn more about evaluation, we have a very uh, sort of beginning level evaluation webinar coming up in March. But let's talk, go back to sustainability and evaluation. So Nancy, did you have a specific question for me? Oops, we seem to have lost Nancy. Can you guys hear me OK? I can. So you're on mute there. Okay. I, um, I was trying to make sure I didn't, didn't distract <laughs> Lori, and I muted myself. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I kind of put forth my thoughts as a consultant and a researcher as to why I'd want to encourage people to conduct um, this kind of a health check on a more regular basis than, say, an annual evaluation. But I wonder if you could share your thoughts on that, about what, it, what would be the benefit of doing this. Um, so I'm going to speak to uh, evaluation in particular rather than the health checks. I think it, what you're talking about folds just in a very lovely way in with what we recommend for evaluation. And your evaluation results can be reviewed and, and uh, provide a lot of the information that a person would need to do that health check, which has many good uh, question prompts for thinking about the future. Um, but. I, with regard to evaluation in general, particularly in the ATE program, but really in any context, there's going to be three main reasons that we do evaluation. So the first is going to be to get information that you can use to improve as you're implementing your project. And you guys gave some, some great examples of that. And that, of course, is going to feed into sustainability. So if you're doing better work and get a, getting better outcomes, that's going to support uh, sustainability in the long run. And the second reason is going to be to get some good evidence of the effectiveness of what you're doing and build on our knowledge base about what works in these types of interventions um, to help advance knowledge and uh, add on to the add on to the like I said the evidence base about what works and in, in, in doing technician education and improving uh, reach to underrepresented groups serving industry and so forth um, and then the third reason is simply because it's required and it helps demonstrate accountability to funders but I would say that that's the, uh, if that's the only reason folks are going to do evaluation, that's probably you're going to get the least out of it. So I really like this longer term view of what, uh, actually a short term view and a long term view combined. How are we doing as we're doing it and let's improve? And then how does that fold into the, the long term view of how we can keep providing, doing this work and providing this service? Yeah, and in fact, I'm reminded, I didn't pause to read it, but um, someone named Russ Reed in the chat window several minutes ago mentioned that, um, you know, it actually had a very practical function in terms of substantiating an argument they made for, for you say an award, but I'm guessing you meant for a funding award. But in other words, I mean, this, it, it can, it can kind of feed into the way you think about it, but it also makes an argument externally as well. 
So. Yeah, so I can, um, that reminds me that anybody who is funded by the National Science Foundation and then wants to go back to get additional funding, uh, you should be aware that any time a PI or a co-PI, so that's a principal investigator, um, is on a proposal and they've been funded by NSF uh, um, within the last five years, there's a requirement within the proposal to report on the results of that funding. So in an NSF proposal, it's 15 pages long, and you can spend up to five pages, which is you know, a full third of the proposal to present evidence of the results of the prior uh, funded and prior NSF funded work. And these have to be, these results have to be framed around the NSF merit review criteria for intellectual merit and broader impact. So you have up to five pages, and you talk about uh, evidence of intellectual merit and evidence of broader impact from your prior work. In the ATE program, they specifically say they want this to go first. So it just shows how important it is that you have meaningful evidence of the quality of your work and the impact of your work when you go back for more funding. And I've talked uh, with program officers at NSF about this. And they say one of the uh, a common thing that they see will be for the proposer to copy what was in their prior proposal about what they were going to do and paste that in as their results of prior support. And that just doesn't cut it. Like we really, they really want to see meaningful evidence. Um, and it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be, uh, you know, just amazing results. You change the world. It can be, also can be about uh, lessons you learned about the work and how to do it better. So they all, the NSF program officers really like to see how you use the evaluation results to make adjustments to what you were doing to improve the work. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Um, right, copying and pasting probably doesn't, unless possibly everything came out exactly the way you projected it would, <laughs> which it never does. So um, I wonder, Lori, is there, I, this is not a question we had talked about before, but I realized I should have asked, are, are there any things that I mentioned in those slides, which again are fairly generic, that are different from things that people are most often already gathering data on? Or do they look pretty similar to the things people already well, I think would have. Yeah, I think it's very consistent. Um, one thing that um, I thought of as you were talking, Nancy, was that when we talk about um, evaluation, we're almost always talking about looking at process and outcomes, implementation and outcomes. How well did you do your work? Did you reach who you intended to reach? Uh, you know, did they learn something? Did they do something differently? What impact did it have on on your um, in the industry that you serve and in your in your institution, did you change policy? Did you change um, the culture of the institution? Um, and sustainability, like evaluation, like every NSF proposal needs to have a sustainability plan, and the things you're raising are, are very useful for that. Um, but something we have to shift our mindset a little bit when we think about evaluation for sustainability or to to assess sustainability, right? Because that's future oriented. So the evaluation of process and outcomes, we're gathering evidence and we can tell you, we, the evaluation can produce results that explain what happened because of this project. But when we think about future oriented in terms of sustainability, it's a, a little bit different of a shift because it's more predictive. Um, and one of the, uh, Wayne Welch who's done some research on ATE, uh, sustainability factors uh, within the ATE program, at least per as perceived by PIs, what PIs perceive as important with regard to sustainability. In a report he has on our website, he identifies seven things. Um, and I think some of them are really interesting. One has to do with um, having a lot of partners. Mm -hmm. Like you don't just have, you don't rely on one partner, one funder, you distribute that. Um, another one is having a lot of data so you know what's going on and you can use the information uh, to make adjustments and there's a few others. But um, to get back to your question, like it's very consistent with what uh, you're, you're talking about. But I think when you look at evaluation data you're collecting, you need to shift your focus a little bit towards the future if you're going to use that information for sustainability. Yeah, and in fact, that's such a great way to put it. I, I wish I had, it's funny, I don't, I hadn't thought about it that way, but that's actually exactly what it is. Um, one, and one of the, one of the key ways to, I mean, you know, to, to the extent that it's possible to predict or take good guesses about the future, um, the kind of harder and more reliable 
the uh, the data you're doing that on you know, the data you've got you know is. So I wanted to come back to something that you said about learning from mistakes. One of the things I've noticed in some reporting, and I, it's perfectly understandable, and, and this is just me, so tell me if you don't agree with this either, but is, is a desire to kind of cast everything in a very rosy light, um, you know, um, in, in whatever means necessary. I think one of the kind of examples I use just because I think it's amusing is to say, oh, we had 400% growth in the number, of, in the amount of uptake of this product or service, and 400% growth turns out to be, you know, from two users to eight users, right? And so, but but the benefit, but the logic of of presenting it that way was to make it sound good. Um, I'm going to guess that from what you're saying, that that would not be the approach. That you're looking at a more kind of how do I really understand what's going on here? That, that right, and I think uh, that that can happen when people are trying to make things look rosy externally. But I think you would probably agree with me. If you're being honest because you really want to set your project up for success, you need to look at what's really happening. Um, so you can, uh, you know, it's you want to find those those those. Um, weaknesses in a project and fix them mm -hmm. before you get to the end. And mm -hmm. using evaluation in a very sincere way with the earnest desire to find out what's not working can really help you in the long run. It doesn't mean you have to report every little, you know, uh, little failing, um, but it's really about using that information in real time, finding out what's, what's working and isn't working. Um, but then when it comes out to reporting it, particularly with reg regarding in a proposal, when you're talking about your results of prior support, um, they want those results to be framed in terms of intellectual merit and broader impact. Um, so you want to have those be substantial findings and be able to back up your claims uh, with sound evidence. And I think reviewers can see through glossing over things like the example you just gave. Yeah. Yeah, this is Rachel. <laughs> I just have to say, I always think it's funny that, you know, even for us, our evaluator often reminds us that, you know, we get to choose what we share, but asking the hard questions is always a benefit. How, what percentage of that information we choose to share is our choice, but it, it's so informative for our own, you know, evaluation, our own sustainability, our own growth as a, as a project, and I think it's, it's sort of easy to forget that this is first for you to work on what you're doing, and then you report back. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point, right? Even if it's just your own leadership team hacking through this together, and you figure out which piece go <laughs> you make more public. Um, so we have another, uh, maybe it's the last question for you, Lori, but um, when you see how people do undertake evaluation for their own work, um, do you have any kind of guidance, piece of advice, that you just would love to impart to them, um, things either you, you wish they were doing a little differently or ways you'd like to encourage them on? Well, and just to, just to pre preface any remarks I make, I, I don't have a, like, I'm not omniscient when it comes to everything that's going on uh, in the ATE program with evaluation, so my comments aren't, you know, don't speak to all of ATE. Uh, I've been exposed to evaluations in a lot of different contexts, but I do see, have seen a fair number of, when it comes to a formal report, let's say, for a project, where a lot of the eval external evaluator's time, so the consultant's time, um, or maybe it's an internal evaluator, but that, pers uh, that person had to spend a lot of time describing what the project did. Uh, and, a, and sometimes a lot of that is redundant with what the, the NSF-funded PI has to put in their annual report. So I would advise people to use their external experts strategically where they're going to get the most bang for the buck. So don't ask your evaluator to repackage descriptive information that you, you're you already going to report to your NSF program officer in your annual report. And really uh, use that expertise to bring some extra value to your project. So you have to spend money on evaluation, and but it can end up being more valuable than the money you spend if you're getting really useful information, you're learning things that you couldn't have learned on your own, and you're really leveraging that person's expertise and external perspective to um, 
to learn about your project uh, and, and use the information to move forward. So that's why, I mean, I would just get real serious about it. Um, let's look at, yes, it's important to look at implementation. Don't overlook, it, overlook that, um, but also moving on to outcomes, even if it's difficult to get down that out to those long-term outcomes, we can start with the, the nearer-term outcomes and try to get evidence of outcomes that, to complement the evidence about outcomes and leave, like, reiteration of what a project is doing to the, to leave that to the project because they already have that information. You don't need to, uh, to waste your evaluation resources on that. So that's very, that's very simple. Um, another thing, again, just to reiterate what we've already said, is to actually use the information as you go along. Uh, when I do a webinar, and maybe you guys are the same way, but when I do a webinar, I immediately look at those results. Not even I don't wait for a report. I just go into those results, see what people liked, what you know, what worked, what didn't, and I can make adjustments right away. So, actually, take the information seriously and, and use it as you go along. That's terrific. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, we're gonna. I'm gonna move along. If there's, uh, we have one little last part of this, but feel free to jump in if there are other thoughts you have to share. We have an, another poll question for the group, um, and then we'll wrap up. And we have stick around with us because we do have a final evaluation of this webinar, and we definitely want you all to respond. Absolutely. All right. Let's do a quick poll question here. Um, Mike's gonna open that. Just thinking about how this kind of an exercise that Nancy and um, has described and Lori's talked about too in some ways. Um, so what do you think the the health check would sort of help you, would help support you with? Um, lots of folks are saying how to integrate sustainability planning into their existing evaluation work. That's great. Um, a lot of people saying all of the above. So, and there we go. That's great to hear that so many people feel like it's going to help them with looking at other areas of opportunity and audience, as well as the sustainability planning, as well as the um, collecting data for decision making. Yeah, and there's, I don't think there's really any wrong answers here. I mean, these are these are all great things to be doing, and I think in general the guidance is doing it at all is much better than not doing it. So, <laughs> yes, as Celeste, Celeste, like Celeste Carter, the lead program officer says, you know, as with evaluation, do it early, do it often. Yeah. So, Great. all right, well, let's move on. So, uh, nothing fancy about the next steps. The next step is you should do some flavor of this, but the real question is you're going you're to have to figure out what questions to ask. So, th these slides I characterize as, um, suggestions, ways to think about it. The actual questions really need to come from the things that you've identified as the critical kind of factors for success in all those different areas. Um, I think the other function of this presentation is to remind you that you may not, you may have thought about looking at the outcomes as a basic thing or the audience as a basic thing, but maybe not everyone thought to look at questions like the current level of expense we need or our leadership plan for the future. So there's some things in here that you may do less often and I'd encourage you to set, up, set yourself up with a list of questions about each of these key topics. Um, if I didn't point it out before, you might note that the questions we covered in each of those slides literally map to an element of what we talked about as the sustainability kind of model, the whole cycle where you've got to look at the external elements and you've also got to come back inside and look at the operational elements. And these questions in the health check um, you know, path suggest that you, you look at all of those things. And then how quickly will you start? <laughs> where do you get the information and how quickly will you start? I think generally I'd recommend take a shot at it this afternoon. Take out a pen and start to sketch out some ideas of what this could look like. And um, to hark back to, to Lori's good guidance, you know, there's no, no uh, copying and pasting from other things. This is really intended to be a fresh set of eyes on the information so that, uh, you know, you're getting good information and you can make some decisions going forward. So I'll just begin the wrap up. Rachel, did you want to say something? No, no, I was just going to do the same. Yep. So don't go just anywhere. Just reminding folks to, yeah. We're going to have, we have a survey for you in about one second. So please stay on the line. But this is just my chance to remind you that we have two next 
webinars coming up with two terrific guests. Um, it's really going to be quite a series altogether, I have to say. And we're going to take the ideas we've discussed today and, and take them to that next step. So we're going to talk about decision making. And once you've figured out uh, that you've gathered the data and you're think, looking about it, you're seeing where the trends are going, what are different tactics you can use to start some of that decision making? So we're going to be building off what we've learned today when we meet again next month. Um, and then again, of course, the succession planning piece that, that is going to take place um, in April. Um, so Rachel, you want to right, take it from so, here? Yeah. Well, we want to thank everybody. Mike's going to go ahead and open that, that survey for everybody to take, a uh, vital survey. And um, that should pop open in a new window for most of you. Um, uh, you'll see it in just a second. We want to thank, particularly thank Lori Wingate for doing such a stellar job. And as always, we want to thank Mike and his crew um, who do such a nice job with hosting these webinars. Thank you, Rachel. Rachel, just let me comment that for some people, it may not automatically open. They would have to click on the link click there on that. and then click on the browse yeah. too. It depends on your browser or what you're using. but. For most people, it will come up. And you know, Rachel, when we send out the recording, we also put in the survey reminder if people didn't have a chance to do it. So I think we'll be OK. Right. They can, they can go back in and do the survey. And just to remind you, too, Nancy was saying, you know, as you start to think about these new steps, if you're trying to remember what questions uh, Nancy was asking, as, as we mentioned, you'll get the slides. You'll get a link to the webinar. You'll get, you'll get everything. So it, it, probably in the next 24 to 48 hours, as, as Mike mentioned. And thanks to everybody for uh, hanging in with us through this about an hour and 15 minutes. And we look forward to seeing you uh, in March and April in the next uh, couple of webinars. Hope everybody has a good day. And if you're in the north, in the cold part of the country, stay warm. And if you're in Mike's part of the country, enjoy yes. the weather. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel and Nancy and Lori. So folks, I'm going to now uh, end the webinar recording that officially ends our recording and our, our presentation for today. Please join us for the next two webinars in the series. Goodbye, everyone.